go ahead and start the recording on this. Uh, but first of all, I want to thank Academy for providing this for us. They, of course, are a sponsor of this training program, so they help make it possible so that everybody can attend for free, which is a real, it's a great asset for our company to have this. Um, George, in particular, has worked very closely with me and has always been good to not only provide good service for my clients, but for our agents as well. They've done a great job. So I talked with George to kind of tell me some of his biggest concerns out there and to create some little mini trainings so that we can be better real estate agents. Today I wanted to cover one that kind of goes along with today's listings. Uh, one of the big problems that George is seeing out there is agents that list condos and they have no idea you know, four or five months into the listing, it even goes under contract, they have no idea if that condo is warrantable or not. So let's discuss really quickly what that is. We're going to go over conventional guidelines, FHA guidelines, and non-warrantable transactions. The problem is if the condo is not FHA approved, then no buyer can get an FHA loan on that. And in our advertising, we list uh, particularly if it's you know the types of loan programs that are available like on the MLS for example I'm gonna check that you know they can buy it with cash they can buy it with a conventional loan with FHA or VA and this is something that I need to know up front so how do I figure out if my condo listing is warrantable well let's go over the definition first condominium can be a, a variety of different real estate projects and a lot of times they take apartments in fact I closed on one a couple weeks ago that uh, they had clearly been apartments and they knocked out a wall and turned it into a condo. And so it was uh, what used to be four apartments per floor had turned into two condos per floor of a, a three-story project. And it had all been redone and, and actually turned out pretty nice. But basically, here's the following characteristics, generally two or more units. The interior space of the units is individually owned, so they don't own the exterior. The balance of property, both land and building, is owned in common by the owners of the individual units. And the common areas, areas are administered and maintained by an owner's association that levies monthly maintenance charges against each unit owner. So that's the basic definition of a condo. Now, what you need to know is whether or not yours is FHA approved. And there's this website that you can go to. Now, rather than type in this website and look up your condo association, what I would recommend, and I recommend this in a lot of cases actually, is rather than try to be the expert in a hundred different things, just learn who the experts are and use them. And in this case, it's free. So have George Coleman himself, and you can just write down his number. That's easier than this web address. But give George a call. If you're listing a condo, give him a call and say, hey, here's the address of the condo. Here's the name of the condo. Could you look that up and let me know if it's FHA approvable? And it also, it could be an FHA approved condo that has an expiration coming up, or maybe it was approved, but now that's expired. And that's something that you have to pay attention to, okay? So Academy Mortgage has a condo approval department that can assist you in getting uh, an HOA approved. And, and that can be a vital service for your clients, especially now that most loans today are FHA. So conventional guidelines. Well, I was talking with George about this and going over this training. I asked him, what if it doesn't approve for FHA guidelines? What are their other options for it? And he, this is truncated because the definition that he gave me was just nuts. And I said, we've got to keep this simple for the agents. You know, what, what do they really need to know? And he says, they really need to know that they're difficult. There are pages and pages, I think he said like 150 pages of different rules that they have to go through. And again, he's the expert on that. You don't have to be. Um, but it can be very, very complicated if it's not FHA approved. So if it is uh, listed as a, an approved project, then no further project review is needed. Conditions of the Fannie Mae 1028 approval or conditional approval must be met. Conditional commitments are no longer acceptable. and Fannie Mae will not issue a conditional final project acceptance any longer. The individual loan file must contain a copy of the approved list that shows the name of the project and the expiration date. So in other words, 
in order for that loan to go through, it's got to show up on that approved list and be within its expiration date. So if your project does not show up in the Fannie Mae website under the approved list, then the automatic underwriting system will dictate a limited review or a full review. And he's simplified and says this review process is extensive. And that's probably the, uh, I don't know, it, it's, it's like calling a mountain a molehill. It's extremely complicated and requires cooperation from the, FA, from the HOA, for example. You know, they have to get from the HOA a list of all the, the minutes of all their budget expenditures for like the last five years. And a lot of these HOAs, they're not professionally run. You know, and so to have them come back and give you, provide you with all of this stuff in order for you to sell a, a little condo, uh, sometimes it's extremely hard to make that happen. Um, he says at a bare minimum, though, plan on it taking a while, 45 to 60 day close. So basically, what you need to know is this. If you're listing a condo right up front, at the very beginning of your listing, you need to find out if it's in an FHA approved place. And the best way to do that is to contact George. Get, send him an email, george.coleman at academy.cc. I think that's probably the easiest way to get a hold of him and say, here it is, here's the address, what can you tell me about it? And George can help you with that. With that said, let's jump into our this one. Okay, jump into our training today. Now today we're talking about listings, but first of all, we got to be accountable for our home week, homework last week. Last week we talked about working with your ideal week list, okay? Getting your ideal week put into a calendar guide, planning some time every morning so that your day is organized, and being accountable to yourself every evening. So hopefully you guys were able to do that again. Doing this weekly thing is really important part of your personal growth and growth as an agent. I'm not going to dump a million tons of information on you uh, just to satisfy curiosity. That's not the goal here is to satisfy a whole bunch of curi curious agents. The goal here is to develop great high performing agents. And if you'll take my word on this and do the homework, you will become that. And, and we've got, I don't know how many uh, rookies of the year in our offices and, you know, really high performing agents and, and some top agents that fell off the, the top ladder. For example, one of the top agents in, or, or the top agent in the Twilla Association took this training. She said it was her first year in, uh, I don't know, like 10 years or something that she had not been the top agent. She took the training and immediately recaptured her spot. So this stuff works, but you got to put it into practice and it needs to be put into practice weekly. The deep thought that's going to drive us today is a person does not care how much you know until they know how much you care. We've all heard this thought before. How does it apply to listings? Well, a lot of times with listings, we get tempted to over-prepare, um, especially if we're a new agent. So we go, go in there with a ton of information you know, a real fancy listing presentation and all of this uh, research that we've done. And it's true that we do have to do all of that stuff, but we go in there and we just basically regurgitate all of this stuff in the laps of the sellers. And it, in a lot of cases, I hear of real estate agents that don't even walk through the house before regurgitating all of their information in the client's lap. And the client definitely feels like they haven't been cared for when the agent tells them how much they're going to sell their house for and never even bothered to look at their house. So that's why I put this thought in here. It's not so much about your presentation. Now that's good news for you guys that are newer or don't feel like your presentation is super sharp. You don't have to have a super sharp presentation. What you have to do is be personable. Let's talk about how to accomplish that. We're going to go over what to do prior to the listing appointment, all the preparation that you do need to make because you do need to be prepared, what you do at the listing appointment afterwards, and we'll go over a lot of marketing ideas for you. Some of the resources that you have at your disposal. We have a listing presentation. It's a very nice presentation. You will need to customize it, tailor it just a little bit to you. But as brokers, last year we got together and put this together. It's on the equity archive, and it's a good-looking listing presentation. Okay. Seller's binders. I, I always recommend on working with buyers and sellers, get a little half inch three ring binder for each of your clients just so that you appear organized. Again, I've had agents 
do this, brand new agents, on their very first appointment, and they went out and met with somebody. They had their binders there. They were organized. They had, you know, they weren't shuffling through a whole bunch of loose paperwork in front of their clients. And the clients told them, and mind you, this was their very first appointment. And the clients said to them, man, I wish I'd talked to you first. You're so much better prepared. You're so much more professional than everybody else that we've talked to. Okay? So, and of course, you've got your 24-7 buyer acquire hotline. If you are not using this hotline, you should either get in there and figure out how to use it, or you should contact your broker and say, who is a great agent I can refer leads to and make 25 to 30 percent? Because just by going in here, I can, like if I'm too lazy to call back my buyer acquire leads or too busy or whatever the excuse is, I can go in here and have all of those leads go to a certain agent. And then I call that agent up and I say, look, uh, you were referred by the broker as being a top agent for this area. Um, I want to refer all my buyer acquire leads to you at a 25% referral. How would you feel about that? And that agent says, hey, that's fantastic. I'd be happy to. And so if you're not using these leads and you're not capturing them, maybe even if you don't feel good about them. For example, Steve Stringham, you guys know Steve. He's a, he's a high producing, uh, well, was one of my top producing agents. Now he's a broker. Uh, but he did this didn't feel like he captured the buyers very well off of his buyer acquire calls. And so he sent them to me because I could capture them well and, uh, and paid a referral fee off of them. Okay? So you can make arrangements like that as well, but all of these resources should be used. Let's talk about what you need to do to prepare for your listing appointment. First of all, you are going to need detailed information about the house. Typically, this comes from the seller themselves. They just tell you whatever they know about it. Now, a lot of times that information is wrong. For example, I've had people tell me the year of the home. This happens a lot with new homes because they say, you know what, we, uh, yeah, we're the only owners of it and it was built in 2006. Well, it was actually finished in 2005, uh, you know, November of 2005, but it, it, they didn't close on it until February of 2006, but as far as county records go, it was built in 2005. So you're going to ask your client detailed information about the house, but don't take that as gospel. You still have to do your research. I also see a lot of times people say, yeah, it's a five-bedroom house, but you go in and look at it, and one of the rooms doesn't have uh, a window, or it doesn't have a closet or something like that, so you can't call it a five-bedroom house in your marketing. That's information that, again, you need to be aware of. So you're going to ask your client for detailed information. Next, you're going to check the MLS for past listings. Now, what I do about this is I, I go on the MLS, and I don't care about uh, what status it is, whether it's active, under contract, sold, and I do want to check include historical data so that it goes, my search goes back more than a year. But uh, the reason why I want to do this is because that will give me right away some extra information that my clients didn't know. Okay, I should be getting, you know, I can get tax ID numbers from this. Uh, there's a lot of information that I can find out about a home uh, based off of past listings on the MLS. So I want to check that out. Next is checking title. And basically with these things here, I'm trying to become an overnight expert on the property. And honestly, maybe it's not overnight. Maybe this takes me 30 minutes, okay? Um, but I want to make a call to the title company and say, hey, I'm going to be going out on this listing appointment. I need to make sure that I'm meeting with the right owners of the property. You guys have uh, attended that training with me a few weeks back where we talked about some of the common purchase contract challenges. And one of them that we discussed that's actually fairly common is people meeting to sell the home and they're not all the owners of the property. Or maybe they're not even owners at all. I've seen children sign listing agreements when it's the parents that own the home. Now, obviously, they're grown kids. They're you know in their 20s or whatever. They've gotten married. But their parents are the owners of the home, and the kids signed the listing agreement. It's completely invalid, and it's a huge waste of that agent's time. So before you go on the listing appointment, check title. If you can't, because a lot of times we get a call to go out on an appointment, and you know title might take a little bit longer to get us that information, either way, call title as soon as possible so that you don't waste a lot of time. The most common scenario where we find problems with this is in cases of divorce. You know, a lot of times if there's a divorce, they decide to sell the family home, 
but spouses aren't talking to each other or cooperating with each other very well. And so checking title tells you that there are two owners of the property. They've both got to sign your listing agreement for that to be valid. So you're going to have to find out a way to meet with both of them. And that's good information to have up front. Next, you're going to prepare your comparative market analysis. And I'll show you that in just a second here, actually right here. So here's what I think needs to be in a comparative market analysis. And all of these things are in that equity prepared presentation for you. Okay, so this is all available for you again on the equity archive. But first of all, what we've got in here is a marketing plan. Every agent needs a plan. Uh, of course, you want to share that with your clients, but you've got to have a plan yourself. What are you going to do to sell this property, to help your clients sell the property? And uh, you know, just, just something that you can put in place yourself. And of course, you want to share that with your clients so they know uh, exactly what to expect from you and so that you can deliver on it. So you need your marketing plan. And I'll be giving you a lot of tips at the end of training here that can maybe help boost that up and, and make it look more impressive. Next, you've got a market analysis explanation. We need to explain to our clients uh, why we're, why, you know, what comparable properties are, what a market analysis is, um, why we're not comparing the uh, uh, the, the neighbor across the street who's got a two-story with their split entry home, you know, and, and their two-story is 20 years newer or whatever, uh, and that sold for 300000 and we're going to step in and tell them they can sell theirs for 200000 You know, so, so we have to give a little bit of an explanation, a little bit of education to our clients so that they can understand. Then we've got three gra graphs included in there, market activity, pricing period, pyramid, and consequences of overpricing. And the purpose of these three graphs is just in a more colorful, visual-oriented way to help your clients understand the importance of pricing the home right the first time so that it's not on for a year and we're constantly nagging them for price reductions. Okay? Then we have a page in there for your price recommendation and listing options. Now let me explain listing options really quickly. Um, I recommend... Uh, for the sake of a closing argument, but as well because not very many of our clients are all in the same situation. I recommend that you prepare a couple different listing options. Let me explain how I use this and then I'll give you some examples of mine. Um, okay, when I get to the end of my presentation and I need to close, I've been to lots of trainings, I've bought lots of training programs and I've heard lots of cheesy hard sell closing techniques. You know, and you hear these people saying, close, close, close. Guys, we are not used car salesmen, all right? And, and although some people may view us that way, I don't think that's a favorable viewpoint that we need to bolster anymore by our actions. So, no, I don't close, 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 all right? That, to me, creates a wall. It distances, uh, distances me from my client. Excuse me just a moment. Okay. Um, what I want to do is I want to provide some good information to them, help them make an educated decision, show them that I am uh, that I've got a fantastic marketing plan to take care of their goals, and then I want to find out what their goals are and give them some different options to accomplish those goals. So in my closing technique, rather than say, "So if you don't have any questions, here's the paperwork that we need to sign." That's assuming the sell. There's not necessarily anything wrong with that. It's just very awkward for me and uh, most people to do that kind of close. Or there's a lot out there that are much worse than that. Um, for me, what I like to do is I get to the end of my presentation and I say, okay, so the only question left is how much would it cost to sell your home? Hopefully you guys know that uh, I will be doing as much or more than any other agent out there with my marketing plan. You've been able to understand what homes are selling for. Now the only question left is how much money can you get out of your home? So we've got to determine a, a price for it and what listing option works best for you. And I've got three different listing options for you. And, and guys, I've used, I've had lots of different things. One, I had a 7% listing option. And I provided moving services for my clients. If it was over a $200,000 home, I had a mover that would help them move locally for $2,000. Okay, and that was a fixed expense. I knew about it. 
So my extra percent, my, my four instead of three, would go and pay the movers for them. So I'd say I've got a 7% plan here. This is for people that really want to be pampered. If you've never had a professional mover, I've got some, and they do a great job for you. And so at 7%, I'll pay your moving services. 6% is kind of the industry standard. It's what everybody does. And I've got that option as well. But I've also got an option that will save you a little bit of money at 5%. At 5%, I take 2%. I always offer 3% to a buyer's agent. There are agents out there that will offer some discounts like me, but they split it 2.5, 2.5, .5, and, and that hurts you because when you offer a buyer agent less, they take their clients somewhere else where they're going to get paid their full 3%. So I take 2, I offer 3 to a buyer's agent, and I give you this discount because you're moving somewhere locally and you can use me as a buyer's agent, and that doesn't cost you a dime. So if you're moving locally and you can use me as your buyer's agent, then I'll make a commission on that purchase as well, and that doesn't cost you anything. You'll get a lot of great service there, but it will allow you to save some extra money here in selling your home. So those are my options. Which one works best for your situation? And that's my close right there. Which one works best for your situation? And I've had people pick 7%, and I've had people pick 5%. And sometimes, you know, if it's uh, like if going into it, somebody told me that they were just flat broke and they had no equity, I might prepare a cheaper option for them. This is totally up to you, okay? And this is one of the things I love about equity is that it provides us with the freedom to be as aggressive in our marketing as we want to be. I had one agent that charged $4.99. That's it. He paid the equity fee. And I called him and I said, why are you doing this? You're working for free. He says, yeah, but I'm picking up a lot of buyers from it. Well, not enough. He went out of business within the first year. But again, I don't love the fact that he went out of business. I love the fact that equity allowed him to try whatever kind of aggressive marketing program he liked. Now, some of you agents out there might be scowling right now and saying, I hate those agents that discount. Well, hate them or love them. It's legal. It's your competition. And as an equity agent, you have the right to be as competitive or aggressive or whatever that you want to be. I know a lot of agents that will not negotiate down on their commission, and that's fine too. What they do is they highlight themselves on their service, their marketing plan. So whichever route you want to go, come up with a couple of different options to provide to your clients, and I think that makes for a really easy closing technique. Which one of these options fits your situations the best? And Typically, the spouses turn to each other then and, and discuss and say, you know, um, I would like to save money. And one says, you know, yeah, but you break everything when we move, and so I'd like to do that program. And they turn to me and say, you know, let's do this. Uh, let's do the 5%. I say, okay, fantastic. And I will have a buyer broker agreement there with me, and they'll sign a listing agreement and a buyer broker agreement with me on the same day. And I've done that many times. Okay, so anyways, this is what I think needs to comprise your market analysis. We're going to put all this together now. We're going to get, we've got our detailed information about their house, our own research that we've found here. We've got our market analysis. We need to add to that a short introduction for us and the company just so that they know who they're dealing with. Explain the comps, the price, explain our three different pricing options resolve concerns, okay? So all of this stuff is what we've got ready to go when we go meet with them. And this might look like a lot of information here, but once you've got your listing presentation put together and you've got your pricing options done, then all you have to do is change the name on the page to their name and you're ready to go. You've got to make a call to title, you got to do a little bit of research from the MLS about past listings, but you should be able to do all of this stuff in a half hour to an hour tops to be ready for your listing presentation, okay? So that takes us to the listing appointment. Now here's the most important rule that I can pass along to you guys today, okay? <clears throat> your listing appointment needs to last no longer than one hour. And here's the reason for that. You've all been in meetings where it was advertised, you know, that it would end, let's say it would end at noon, okay? And it really doesn't matter what time they advertise, but if it doesn't end at that hour um, in that meeting, it doesn't matter how neat the stuff is that the person is saying, 
people start to grumble, they start to lose focus, they start to lose concentration, they've got other places that they made plans to be at because you advertised that it would be short. And although you may not advertise to your listing appointment that it's going to take an hour, people automatically reserve that much time in their mind. And so from the moment you knock on the door till the moment that you have that contract signed, you need to be one hour, all right? Now that's going to take a lot of work. My first appointment was two and a half hours. It was my own neighbor and I did not get the listing because I, I just took too long. And even though I think they liked me personally, well I know they liked me personally. We were on good terms with them. Um, the only thought in their mind at the end of two and a half hours was how do we get this guy to shut up and leave? We've got dinner, we've got kids crying that need to be put to bed. And I was just rambling because I was so nervous being my first presentation. Okay, so learn from my mistakes. Don't make the same ones. So here's what needs to comprise your hour. First of all, you're going to greet and meet the family. Yeah, that takes a little bit of time. Meet everybody. Um, next, you take charge right away. Okay, so I go in. You can have a clipboard or you can have your three-ring binder, but something hard that you can walk around and take notes with. Now, this also accomplishes a subtle change in the seller's mind that you're a worker, okay? Uh, you're not just a stuffed suit that showed up that's going to, you know, the number one complaint that we always hear from sellers is, oh, they stuck a sign in the yard, put it on the MLS, and I never heard from them again. Number one complaint right there against listing agents. So we're going to show up as workers. We've got a clipboard, we've got a pen, we're ready to go. Um, and uh, we're going to kill three birds with this one stone. So after we've met everybody, typically what they say is, so where, do, where would you like to sit? You know, family room or do we need the table at the kitchen? And one of the reasons I love having a clipboard or my three ring binder available is a lot of times we're meeting in the evening at their home and the kitchen table has not been cleared yet from dinner. And sometimes they've still got kids eating there. And so I want to be able to sign all my paperwork, have everything presentable from sitting on somebody's couch, all right? So that's why I like having all that stuff there and ready. Um, so I say, you know what? Uh, it really doesn't, we can sit wherever you're comfortable, right here, you know, if I see the table is dirty, I'm gonna say right here in the living room is fine. I say, but then I say, however, I would love to see the home first. Would you mind taking me on a tour, okay? Now they're expecting this. If you don't do this, they're going to be really disappointed. And I have followed many agents in listing presentations, you know, because the people interviewed more than one, where once I said that, they made the comment that, ah, oh, we've interviewed two other agents. Nobody's asked to see the home. And that's shocking to me. Okay. So what I do is I, I drop my bags or whatever I brought with me. I grab my clipboard and I get ready to go through with my notes. Okay. Now, I'm going to be doing a couple of things here. The first bird I'm going to kill with this walkthrough is I'm taking notes for my remarks section. When I post this on the MLS, I've got 255 character spaces or whatever your MLS allows that, you know, I need to say charming bungalow with hardwood floors or blah, 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 blah. You know, I, I need to be creative at some point down the line. So I'm going to take notes for that because in my hours time segment that I've got today, I don't have time to get creative with my remarks, okay? I'm not going to try to put all that down on paper today for them to sign. I'll tell you how I, how I get around that later on, but, but right now I'm just taking notes. The next thing I want to do is I want to introduce the concept of fixtures. It's amazing to me how many people are selling their homes and haven't considered whether or not they're going to include washers, dryers, fridges, you know, those are the real obvious ones, and occasionally you'll see um, oh, people want to take their blinds with them or whatever. So I'll bring up fixtures. And, it, you know, in our MLS paperwork, it does mention blinds as, in, as an included item. So I'll just double check. So you're planning on leaving the blinds here, right? You know, and, and I'll usually pick something that I see right off in the first room. And it's something silly like blinds or a ceiling fan or something like that. And they look at me kind of silly and say, doesn't everybody? I said, well, yeah, typically. However, if it's physically attached to the home, it's just understood that it will be 
included. And so if you've got some homemade shelves, something that's, that's you know, a, a chandelier that's kind of a family heirloom or something like that, something that's valuable to you that is connected to the home, we need to make a special note that that is excluded from the cell. Otherwise, it's automatically understood to be included. Now, this is something that they did not know. And when I can set that tone right up front that dealing with an expert, even on some concept as simple as fixtures, when I can set the tone right up front that they're dealing with an expert that has knowledge that they don't have, they start to rely on me. And that's a, that's a good tone I want to set for the rest of the uh, interaction that we're going to have. Okay? The third bird that I'm going to kill is later on I'm going to be talking about price with the home. I've done my research already. I've probably already got it printed what I'm going to recommend that they sell for. However, I need to see the home. Now, occasionally, I'm surprised at how nice the place is. They've really done some nice upgrades to it. And so when I get to the place where I printed out how much they should sell the home for, I'll say, you know what, having seen the home, I think we should raise this. This would be the average. Your home is above average. You should ask for more. Okay? And I'm not afraid to verbally change what I have printed. Sometimes their home is not in good condition. And I'll do just the opposite. I'll say, we'll get to the end and I'll say, you know what, this, home would be, uh, this would be the average sales price for a home. This home has a lot of issues. And I'll mention them specifically. They're, of course, painfully aware of the big stains on the carpet, um, holes in the walls, that kind of stuff. They're aware of it. I'm not shocking them with it. We're just being honest now. Okay? So you've got to be honest with your clients. So I've met the family. I've walked through with the clipboard. That's eaten up 15 to 20 minutes of my one-hour time. Now, this is important time spent, but it has eaten into my hour. So I've got to have a listing presentation I can deliver in 40 minutes or less. So you've got that one that equity provides for you. When you go through that, there's some fluff in there that you may not need. All right, go through that, trim it, personalize it to you, and make sure that it's something that you can deliver in 40 minutes tops. All right, because once that's delivered, you still got to sign some paperwork. So we're going to ask which plan fits their needs the best, because we have a couple different plans available for them, and close. Now, I do this before I talk price. Okay, because sometimes, you know, I'll make a price recommendation in my listing, but I'll let them know right there. I'll say, uh, and this is part of my presentation, I'll say, you know what, some agents have different strategies. Some will come in and they'll use the three highest comps on the market and tell you that your home's worth 250 when it's only going to sell for 200. They know it's not going to sell for 250 or maybe they're just brand new to the industry and they don't know anything, but you can see clearly here, and, and by the way, I will with my comps, I don't feel inclined to pretend I'm an appraiser and limit myself to providing only three comps. There's no need for me to do that. I'm not bound by any rule to do, the, to do so. What I don't want to do is provide them with all the comps, you know, dump 40 in their lap, because that's information overload, and they won't be able to make a decision that night. I'm not doing them a favor with that. What I do use, and I just use a rule of thumb that I learned as an interviewer when I used to manage for another business, is as an interviewer, we could look at two, three pages tops of people's job resumes without being overwhelmed with the information. We, we could get a firm grasp on that. And so if I'm fitting three comps on a page, I can provide two or three pages of comps and my clients can easily grasp that information. So I'll try to fit in a couple of comps on the highest end, you know, the stuff that has the granite countertops. And my client doesn't have that stuff. But I'm going to include a couple comps in there that show homes being sold $50,000 higher than theirs will sell for because it's got a list of all of these upgrades that have been done. I'm going to include some comps on the low end, some of the bank-owned homes that were trashed or whatever and some of the average comps. And I'm going to do this because in my presentation I talk with my clients because I'm not just talking at them. I want to involve them in the decision process. I want to educate them. And so I'll let them know some agents have a strategy that they'll come in and just share with you the very highest comps and convince you that you can sell your home for 250. 
Now, if you were a buyer and you saw your home, which is a nice home, you've got a lovely home here, but you were comparing it to these homes that are five years newer, that have um, professional landscaping, granite, hardwood floors, and the price range on all of them is 250 which one would you buy if you're a buyer? Of course, you'd buy these other homes first, right? And so some agents, they'll use that strategy, but I think that's a disservice to you. And so I included some of the comps that, that these homes are technically comparable to yours in age and size and neighborhood, but price-wise, if you're competing with them directly, your home can't sell at that price. And, and one of the reasons I do that is because I don't anticipate that I will be the only person they talk to. And so if they talk to another agent that uses that strategy, I've just blown him out of the water. They are not going to use him anymore because I've just educated my clients that that's a cheap strategy to pull and it hurts them. And then I say, you know, some agents will also use the very lowest comps because they want you to list your home for less than what it can sell for because that means a quick turnaround, which is a quick commission in their pocket. And, you know, you may end up losing ten or $20,000 uh, over what you could have had getting it listed at market value. So I put some of these lowest comps in here for you to see the condition of those homes so you can kind of compare how they're selling compared to yours. Now, um, if you agree that my listing plan fits you the best, we've got one of the listing options that fits you really well, what I want you to decide is, am I the agent for you? We can talk price, and, and you know, if you want to list high and just fish and see if there's anybody out there, I'll do that for you, okay? But I'm going to do that for you after having educated you that it probably isn't going to sell at that rate. Now, guys, I will take, I've seen trainers say that they, they won't take high price listings. I will because I always get buyer leads off of them. Whether they're high priced or not, I still get calls off of them. Okay, may not get a lot of showings, but I'll get curious people that call off my buyer acquire site. That's valuable to me. Um, so anyhow, uh, I, say, I, I tell them. I'm just real direct. I involve them in the planning process. This is the part where they need to know how much you care. And I'll say, you know, we can list wherever you want. If you're in a real hurry to move, you can see how quickly these homes on the lower end are moving, and you're going to need to price it somewhere around there, okay? And if you want top dollar, honestly, I think this median price is going to represent top dollar for you, but if you really want to fish for a week or two, feel free to try it. Again, my job is to educate you, not tell you what you have to do, all right? Now, folks, that's just my strategy. It works really well for me. Um, I go in prepared. I go in with all the information. I have, you know, six to nine comps showing a range. And my goal, though, is that they should hire me not based on what I tell them their house should sell for. That's part of my education. I need to help them understand that they're not hiring an agent based off of what number that agent says because that's not, it's, it's not a well-educated hiring decision, okay? They should hire me because of, my marketing plan. So um, once they choose you, they can choose their price. Their choice of which agent to hire should not be based on price. They can ask any price they want. Educate them to ask the right price. Now, let, let me go back a page. So we got to do all this in an hour. Okay. At my closing, I say, so which program fits you best? They pick it. I say, fantastic. Here's what we need to get started. I've got my exclusive right to sell listing agreement. And uh, so I go through that really quick. It's got two initials and a signature. And then I'll start going to work, okay? If, if, uh, if they've signed my exclusive right to sell listing agreement and we choose a price, if they want to take more time with you, then that's great. You've accomplished your goal. You can stay as long as they would like now. Like, for example, after signing the listing, we need to get photos. We need to get a key box. We need to put a sign in the yard. You might take all of that stuff with you on your appointment because if they say yes, you can go out to your car, plop a sign in the yard right then. Most of the time they're not, well, not most of the time, but quite often, they're not ready for photo, <coughs> excuse me, for photos to be taken 
uh, they don't have a spare key for you for your key box or anything like that. So I'll end up scheduling for a day or two later to come back and get this stuff done. The other thing that I need to do is there's other paperwork, my seller's disclosures. I leave that with them. I don't have them fill that out while I sit there. I don't need to be there for them to fill that out. So once they've signed that listing agreement with me, I start giving them some homework. We shift into working mode. And I say, okay, here's what I need from you guys. Um, here's the seller property condition disclosures. I need to get these filled out in the next couple of days. It's required by law that we provide these to any interested buyers. So I'll leave this, these with you. Um, the questions are self-explanatory. Read through them. Fill it out to the best of your knowledge. And I'll pick that up in a couple of days. All right? Second thing I need to do is I need to take pictures to do a property tour for your home. Now, um, your home's in great condition now. I can take those now if it's convenient. And I'll only say that if it is in great condition, if they've clearly done a fantastic cleaning uh, in anticipation of my arrival that night. Um, otherwise, I'll say I need to take photos. So I understand this can be a huge chore to get your house really clean. Um, this will be worth it. So is there a time in the next couple days we can have that ready to go? And I'm going to need to have a spare key ready that we can put in the lockbox for your property. And usually that takes them a couple of days, so I'll come back a couple of days later and get all of that stuff done. I'll pick up the seller's disclosures that they've got, and we'll move forward. As far as the other paperwork goes, I've got my exclusive right to sell listing agreement. We have that um, all ready to go. They initialed two pages and signed one, and we're done. We're, under, we're in contract now with them to sell their home. Um, I've got all the MLS data input forms that I've got to get filled out. I've got the notes and the research already done to fill that out. I don't need to sit there in front of them to do that, so I'm not going to take their time. I'm going to have them initial right there, the bottom of all those pages, show them all the notes that I've got, and just say, guys, um, I've got the notes to fill this in. You're just signing a blank form here. I'll fill in all the gaps later, and as soon as I get it listed on the MLS, I'll email you a copy of that MLS listing for you to sign off on and make sure that everything looks accurate. I do pick the price with them then, so I fill in the price, and other than that, it's a blank form. They sign, and I've got all the paperwork that I need so that I'm ready to turn this into equity, okay? So um, set follow-up dates in your contact management software. Every, uh, about every week minimum, and I'll, we'll go over this a little bit in, in homework, but at least once a week, they need to hear from me on what's going on with their home, okay? Uh, market in whatever ways you agreed to in your marketing packet. And uh, the state asks that we get our packets turned in, our listing packets turned into equity within three days of taking that listing. So that's when I need to have seller disclosures back, have it up on the MLS, etc. cetera. Okay? Um, any questions, by the way, so far? Okay, if you've had any questions up to this point, give me just a second. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions typed in, so uh, let's go ahead and go over some of the listing tools. Now, this last part of the training today are just going to be some ideas to help you beef up your, your marketing that you're advertising, okay? Uh, again, we've got the listing presentation for you. Another program that you can get a discount on is this Toolkit CMA. Oh, here's a, something typed in. Okay, I've got this comment in here saying, is the three-day thing really a law? The MLS rules is five days. Well, the three-day thing is not a law. What happened was we got audited. One of our brokers had one of their files audited. And even though it's not a law, the the division came in with their audit and said, where are all these files? And we said, oh, we typically, agents turn them in at closing. And they said, how can you um, say that you are abiding by the law, which says that you actively supervise your agents when you don't even know what files they have listed? And we said, well, um, it doesn't state anywhere in the law uh, a, a deadline for that. And they said, we recommend three days. So that's what we're going by is just the results of an audit that happened on us. And yes, the MLS will also start to fine you if you don't have it put up within 
three or five days. I think MLS is may vary a little bit there. But that's a great question. So again, that's just a recommendation from auditors from the division, but there was no law specifically stating that. But that's our recommendation from equity is get that listing turned in within, you know, even if it's within a week, you're probably going to be just fine. Okay, so it shouldn't stress you out. But within a week, you should have all that paperwork. You should definitely have your seller's disclosures. You should definitely have it in the MLS by then. And, and therefore, uh, your broker should have a copy of it. All right. Um, other advertising tools. If you're going to put it in a newspaper, you should get some discounts from your broker. Basically, let them know. And, and you know, we went around to different newspapers. Uh, this was years ago when advertising and papers actually made sense. I don't think it does much anymore. But we went around to the different newspapers and negotiated discounts. So if the paper does not offer a discount, let your broker know and your broker can probably negotiate a discount with that paper for your listing. Save you some money. All right. Let's get into some of the good tools though. Postlets.com. Uh, and by the way, you need to take notes here um, if any of this is interesting. Postlets gives you a free account and you can develop uh, basically full page color flyers to advertise through different websites like craigslist.com. So it's much better than the typical Craigslist ad, which is just word print, almost like you would see in a newspaper. So I can create a full page color flyer and it's free. And then I can use that link to post it all around on different sorts of web venues, uh, maybe even Facebook or something like that. So Postlets is a good one. Uh, speaking of Craigslist.com, I do know agents that get some good business from Craigslist. One of their secrets is they delete their old listings and repost each week Thursday mornings. Craigslist is, a, from what I understand, a last in, first out business model, meaning that the last add to post is the first one that comes up on people's search engines. So if you post it once, and your listing is five months old, you're 10 pages in before people would ever see your listing. So delete the old listings, repost new ones on Thursday mornings so that you can come up higher on searches. Next, KSL.com or whatever your local paper is, they probably have an online version as well that you can advertise in. Now with KSL, I just learned this last week because I used to post weekly with them, but they have a cap on there. And they actually shut down my account because I was advertising too much. I needed to buy a professional account, which was actually quite expensive, surprised me. They allow up to five free ads a month before you have to start paying them. I think it was 180 bucks was their next level up, and that only took you to 10 ads. So anyways, five free ads a month. So as soon as you list your uh, your property, even if you're taking five new listings a month, you should be able to get it free, at least with our local paper. Um, next, Spotlight Tours. And whatever tour company that's big in your area, again, uh, because of equity size, we can negotiate a significant savings for you. So we've negotiated some big savings with Spotlight Tours. There's several tour companies. You can find out on the equity archive, there's a vendor section and you can see some of the different vendors there that we have negotiated savings with for our, uh, for our agents. They just offered a webinar. This was through corporate uh, this last week. Uh, some of you may have attended that one, but they offered a webinar on a contact management software that was, that was a great tool for uh, social media marketing, and that is through Sharper Agent, and I believe we get that for half price for our agents. Um, Website. Equity provides you with a free website. We actually provide you, I think it's five free websites if you want them. Um, so you, use, you should be able to use that. Um, if you really want an, a professional website, now there is a difference between what we can provide for free and a, a real professional one with all sorts of tools and gadgets. Um, for example, I use one provided by ProAgent websites. And equity has, again, negotiated that for half price for you. So normally those are 80 bucks a month, and we got it to you for $40 a month. So some huge savings there for you through equity. And we've also gone in and had a professional designer design a, a really good-looking equity template for you. So if you're going to get a lot into uh, website marketing to the point that your free site maybe doesn't have all the tools for you, then you could look into a pro agent website. 
Uh, if you have any questions on that, on what a ProAgent website does or something, I'd be happy to, to go over that a little bit as well if we have time. Yahoo Classifieds, there's lots of different free advertising venues out there. Here's one that I recommend, newsletters. Send out a newsletter every month, highlight your listings and your buyers. Maybe somebody that's considering selling, you don't know about it yet, gets your newsletter and they see a buyer that's looking for a home in an area like theirs. Okay? That seller might call you up and say, hey, you've got a buyer right now. I'm interested. Also, for your existing sellers, it's nice for them to see themselves in print. So when they get that newsletter with their home featured, that's nice for them. And they can say, hey, that's pretty cool. And, and then I can call them up that week and say, yeah, I sent that out to 500 of my uh, friends, family, past clients. So it's just one other way I have to get the word out about your listing. That can be a great tool. And I'm going to make a note of that myself because that's one of the things that I need to improve on. Um, okay, the question typed in just barely is, are there discount codes for these sites or logins we should use to get the discount? Uh, no, there are not discount codes or logins. What you need to do is just call the company, like for example, ProAgent Websites. Just give them a call when you're getting set up and let them know that you're an equity agent and you... Uh, and that they have a discount for you. Okay, um, If you go into the equity archive under the vendor site, there may be some special information there for you, but otherwise a quick call to them. For example, I also use that electronic signature program called isignhere.com. Saves me loads of time running around tracking signatures down. And we negotiated that for a discount for our agents as well. So again, you just call them and say, I'm an equity agent. I understand there's a discount for us. Okay. Um, and if there isn't, and it's a service that you think you'd get a lot of value on, again, let your broker know, and maybe we can get it for a discount for you. Uh, but the newsletter can be very valuable advertising to you. Hoofing it. Get out and knock doors. Go for a walk. We, we can all use the exercise. It doesn't hurt us that way. Some of the most successful, a lot of people don't knock doors because of pride. They, they think it's humiliating to be a door-to-door -door marketer. That's not what we're doing. Okay, uh, so get that image out of your head. Some of the most successful agents I've ever heard about, this is one of their primary modes of marketing because it's so personal. They, they get to meet a lot of people this way. So I've talked to a lot of agents that are very successful in selling their homes, and this is one of their rules. They always go out and knock all the doors in the neighborhood. And quite often they end up taking multiple listings in the same neighborhood. So if, especially if you do an open house, the only open houses that I really hear success from is where they need a lot of people right there from the neighborhood. They've hand-delivered a flyer announcing it, so always knock the neighborhood. This can really help you stand apart from your competition. Next, you've got that buyer-acquire system. We've already talked about that, how important that can be. But I meet with, when I in my presentation, I tell my clients that I will not be putting flyers in their yard. And some people gasp at that and say, but... Agents have been doing that for years. Well, I challenge you, put flyers in your yard and then do on another house, put the buyer-acquire system. See which one generates more phone calls. With me, the only time I get calls off of flyers is when my flyers run out and it's somebody calling to complain or my clients calling to complain, which seems to be what happened more often because they're hard to keep full. So you're spending a lot of gas, you're printing a lot of flyers, and in my opinion, and I share this with my clients, in my opinion, I'm unselling their home. Because what I've done is I've satisfied all the buyer's curiosity, they've taken the flyer, it's entered their, answered their questions, and they've moved on, and nobody knows they were even interested. Whereas with my buyer acquire system, they can get all the same information that a flyer gives them, but now I have their contact information and I know that they were interested in that home. Okay, It makes a difference. Now, if, uh, if I want to make up flyers for my clients, I'll tell them, let's make up some nice flyers and put them inside the house. And then people that come in that are serious about it, we're not just satisfying curiosity and they're gone, now we're giving something lasting that they can take with them to remember your house by. And then you're not blowing through millions of flyers either. But I think that's the way to go as far as flyers go and your uh, outside advertising. 
showingfeedback.com is a great free service as well. This doesn't cost anything. And basically what happens when somebody calls in to schedule a showing, you enter their information into showingfeedback.com. It automatically emails them to get their feedback on how the showing went. It'll send them multiple emails. You guys have probably been on the receiving end of these if you've worked with buyers. Uh, pretty common programs. This one happens to be free. Uh, most, a lot of them aren't. Um, but then it takes that feedback that they get and it makes it available 24-7 to your client. So your client gets a little portal that they can log into anytime they want and see the feedback directly from the horse's mouth. So you don't have to be the guy that bears the bad news. You've heard that uh, that adage, don't kill the messenger. Well, sometimes the messenger gets the blame. And when we call up and say, yeah, they said that your house smelled really bad and that it's overpriced. Yeah, that's an awkward conversation for me to have. I would much rather that they read it directly from the person that showed the home. Okay, um, you've got open houses. We talked about that with knocking doors. That's where I think they come in handy. Uh, List Hub. Now, List Hub, you need to talk to your broker and find out if he's a member. Okay, if uh, and, and you should know whether or not your listings come up in List Hub because just just because your broker's a member doesn't guarantee you automatically get entrance into it. Uh, and this was a couple years ago. I don't know if their policy has changed, but when I signed up for List Hub. Only my agents that had active listings at the time were automatically pulled into the system. Now, this is a program that your broker pays for. So I pay a fee for this, and all my agents get it for free. Now, List Hub will try to get you to upgrade your account, of course, to a paid account, which provides extra services. But for free, you should have access to this. Now, what is List Hub? Well, it gets you on a whole bunch of sites. It totals more than 500 real estate search websites. So hundreds of websites out there. And here's just a quick smattering of the logos and lists that some people may recognize. And I try to include this type of thing in my listing presentation. You know, this is where people are shopping. 90, 95% of people start their shopping on the internet. My sellers know that. I want them to know that I am cutting edge as far as the internet goes. I've got my own website. I've got it on up to 500 other real estate search websites, basically anything that they can imagine. Um, I've got tools that get it posted on Facebook. Uh, I I've, I've do my newsletter. Basically, if there's any form or venue of marketing out there, I'm using it. And most of them are free for you guys, very or very little expense, because in this case, your broker pays for it. Uh, my single property website, now this is expensive, um, you actually get a better deal, I think, through, you know, if you want to create a separate website just for your listing, this is a program that does it, or um, my ProAgent website, is one. that's one of the tools in my ProAgent website, is I create a private website for all of my listings, and then I can send that link of that website to my clients, we can post that on Facebook. Twitter, whatever social marketing you use. But I really like having a separate website for each of my listings. So those are a bunch of tools. I'll go back really quick. But guys, if you're using all of these tools, and, and there are a couple more things that you could add to it as well, you know, based on how much money you're willing to spend. But, but considering that almost all of these are free or at a very steep discount for you, it can be very inexpensive to be a fantastic listing agent. Um, so, one of the things I do, for example, is, you know, I, I mean, I'm spending money on websites and, you know, a lot of these tools for my agents, but I tell my clients I spend $500 a month on advertising for you. Now, does all of this add up to $500? Uh, definitely not. For you guys, since a lot of them are free through us, um, maybe 40, 50 bucks tops, okay? But I've, I've got an assistant that runs lots and lots of ads out there posting it and you know and I pay her some money as well so I let my clients know you know it's just not feasible for an average for sell by owner to match the kind of marketing that I can do I spend five hundred dollars a month on marketing and that's not a stretch that's at least what I spend um, now let's talk about communication really quick I've mentioned to you guys that it's the number one complaint against their listing agent is lack of communication so you need a plan a real plan that you put into place on every instance. I recommend a minimum of one to two contacts a week. If you're getting a lot of showings, 
call Tuesday and report on all the showings from the weekend. If you're not, at least every Friday, give them a call, report all your mar marketing efforts throughout the week. I've just given you lots of marketing ideas. You should always have something to report throughout the week of what you've been working on for your clients. This really is helpful that they get this email from me every Friday saying, here's all the sites that we have you at. They can click the links on all of those sites. They can see all the ads that have been posted through all of these different venues. Um, this is very valuable right here, giving them that report. So here's your homework assignment. We're out of time. So your homework assignment is get your listing presentation put together. Make it deliverable in 40 minutes or less. That's going to mean trimming a lot of fat probably. And then get your files organized, seller files, uh, get your binders, cover pages, get everything in there so that you know, you know your checklists and everything that equity has so that you know exactly what you need so that you can get paid on your files so that there aren't delays and so that you, most importantly, look and feel organized when you're working with your clients. Guys, this has been a quick crash course in listings. There's a lot of things here I could go into more detail on, but we're out of time for today. This is going to be recorded and posted to my YouTube account. If you want to go to, I would recommend going to the YouTube, and uh, it's Elite Agent Training. Um, I'm not a YouTube expert, but you should be able to search for that. It's all one word, and, uh, and enroll or subscribe to that channel so that every time I add a new training, you get automatically notified of that, and that would be one way to go back and review notes later on is to just go back and review the video. Uh, at the leisure of your time and, and uh, in your own home. So thank you again for joining me today. I will see you on next week when we talk about buyers. And we'll see you then. Have a great weekend, everybody. And then it's going to be Christmas time. So happy Christmas holidays to everybody, too. Thank you and take care.